and welcome to the Lobby GameSpot's weekly hangout every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific live, live on GameSpot.com. Except this week, uh, we're in transition at the moment, gentlemen. We're in a transitional period. Isn't that right, Eric Day? Yeah, we're getting, uh, We're hoping to maybe next week go live. Yeah. No promises, but that's kind of the hope. Um, Josh and Dan are kind of working on that. I'll help them a little bit. But yeah, we're in transition. Yeah, we got a big old studio next door that's being built. It's actually not getting put together for like three weeks. Uh, so we've, uh, we've, we still have to do it in this room. Uh, we're going to try and get next week uh, to be live. But yeah, we're shopping the show at the moment. If you didn't, if you missed the last week's show, we're, we're shopping the lobby. We're changing up some stuff. We're adding some stuff. And uh, yeah, it's a fun, exciting time. You wouldn't know that, Peter Brown, because you were at CES all last week. That's not true. I paid attention to social media and you were fucking hyped Hype. all the new plans. I mean, it sounds like we're basically ready to clean slate, start new, and you know what? Just do something awesome that mm. isn't what people would expect or what we would normally do. Yeah, I think so. we got safe on the lobby for a while, where it was kind of like it became, because it's kind of, it became such an exhaustively big production that like changing stuff, it's like a big ship, man. It's hard to turn it, you know? So we kind of, we, we, we had our segments and we got like all you guys in as experts to like talk about stuff. We didn't really like listen to a lot of what people kind of wanted. Or I don't think we did. We're doing like the best version of those conversations either. Well, let's be honest too. We had blueprints from the past that we were trying to sort of iterate upon and come up <clears throat> with something that was similar, mm. but fresh. But in that same way, we were also a new team that was kind of trying to establish itself in many ways. And I think now we've kind of got that foothold. So now is probably the right time to actually make our mark. Yeah, and do something cool. And, it, and moving forward is a real good, you know, kind of opportunity to like force yeah. your hand in doing it as well. Uh, yeah. So by the start of February, we'll have a whole new show. Uh, but before we get into what we're going to talk about this week, we got a bunch to talk about. I want to hear what you think about the HCC Vive. You've done all that stuff at uh, yeah. CES again last week. Uh, we're going to talk about all the games coming out in Q1 this year, just to sort of give everyone a bit of a plan of what's happening between now and March, so they can budget. Uh, we're going to talk about all the rest of the Game of the Year awards that were given out by. Uh, our uh, various uh, uh, other gaming websites, our competitors, no, chew our it friends. out, friends? friends, yeah, why competitors, not, man? <laughs> friends and competitors, uh, and we've also got a weird segment with Steve Gaynor and myself playing Counter Strike and talking about Gone Home, uh, which I'll get to a little bit later. Uh, but first of all, uh, there's a couple of we said we we're going to listen to your feedback. We d did a lot of that last week and did a lot of more commenting in the uh, video pages uh, and, and, and on Twitter and whatnot. But I just want to get down to a couple of comments that we saw on the uh, Rebuilding the Lobby video. And specifically these three, which kind of, I think, were general, uh, kind of representing what people wanted out of the, out of the show going forward. God, I hate going forward. I think going forward. Uh, K, K. Babsy, or K. Bazabs, I don't know, says, uh, one thing I really like was the old set. Uh, it felt like a gaming cave and was really well lit and presented. Uh, that said, I think... What you said is true. It felt too scripted, and that showed in the way you guys talked with one another and the audience. Uh, it felt canned and less personal. So I think that's kind of like the crux of what we're trying to fix. It's like we are going back into that room. We're not going to do it in this podcast situation forever and ever and ever. But we do want to make it a bit more like conversational, right, Tay? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things we're thinking about is maybe, like you said, maybe we bring these mics in. We don't know yet. Mm. That's a that's a test kind of thing, but. Um, for the people that were worried, the couch is coming back. There will be some form of a couch. Mm. Um, that's, I think, sort of decided, but uh, it's going to be better. Uh, I think we all kind of have something, a goal in mind, mm. kind of this this fresh goal, and uh, we're going to try to make the best that we can. Uh, another one came in. Drumjod said, this will be a great opportunity to interview all kinds of people involved in video games, such as developers, artists, musicians, programmers, engineers, speedrunners, live streamers, event promoters, the list goes on. This was said by a lot of people, actually. And that kind of like, that's an interesting one because uh, for us, like in video production and probably for you guys on editorial as well, interviews forever, just never, like there's like this vocal minority of people who really like them. Um, but then sometimes you can like, get them to work like i think that would you know i did the witcher stuff that felt like it worked it was like that was something that people were actually interested in um and this week's we do actually have a developer we have steve gainer in like based on a lot of the feedback we immediately he was in town so we said okay fuck it let's try and do something interesting but like traditionally that is something that's kind of hard to sell right like interviews for a long time were were well, yeah. really badly done so people got a bad taste in their mouth i think the big problem with interviews um is that you know so often it's part of the team's marketing push right they're like hey, right. we want our devs to talk to you and you're like that sounds good and you get there and they're like, so they can't talk about X, Y, Z. We'd love it if you would ask them about this. Yeah. And, you know, for a lot of editors, uh, you know, at pretty much every site, they kind of fall into that puddle and they get wet with all the like marketing BS. But there are always topics to discuss because these are actual people. 
And I think if mm. we can get people outside of the marketing sort of calendar in here just to talk about who they are rather than DLC, what mechanics or games <laughs> have, any kind of that bullshit, yeah. I think any interview with a human who is a part of this industry can be interesting. Mm. You just have to figure out, you know, what are they open to talk about? Why do I want them in here? It can't just be about details for their game. Yeah. And that kind of is the problem, isn't it? That most of the time they're available to us is when they are literally doing that. So yeah. we have to kind of be more clever about who we pick. We kind of have to pick, yeah, the right people. Yeah. And actually, it's, it can be hard sometimes because you also, some of the time you know who they are. With Steve, like, it's like, okay, he does idle thumbs. I know he's like good at talking about stuff, right? Sometimes it's just like lead developer for some game. And the game is really interesting, but you don't know if they're going to be interesting. That's so true. Not everyone is good at, at being interviewed. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely something we're working on. And we have it in this week's show. So let us know what you think. And then the last one uh, before we get into this week's show, uh, Jarface, <laughs> great name. Uh, I think that online play with the community will be awesome. Same as uh, sweepstakes, random prizes and mystery boxes, but instead for a chance to play with the cast live online. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so we are going to do that community show. We were, we're talking about exactly what it is. I've been talking to, uh, another thing that people said was we're not going to, if we do it on Friday, we're going to do it before UPF with giant bombs community in mind as well uh, so we're not like cannibalizing uh, cbs video game streams um but yeah we're gonna do that but that won't be on here that'll be this is like our discussion show we're gonna get your guys feedback and talk about games but then whatever the online play thing is uh that's gonna be kind of a it'll be under the the umbrella of the lobby but like a different thing so we're still working it out still shopping it all mm -hmm. right gentlemen you want to talk about video games yeah yeah so All I'm right. Here. I want to talk to you, Peter Brown, mm -hmm. about the Consumer elect Electronics <laughs> Show. Uh, first thing that happens every year, it's like yeah. January it's comes along. Okay, it's going to be nice and quiet for games, but then suddenly all of CNET and some of the techie people on GameSpot end up going to Vegas to see weird contraptions. Uh, how yeah. was this year's show? Before we get in, I really want to talk to you about the HTC Vive specifically because sure. I thought your, your preview last week was very, very interesting. But how was CES this year? It kind of felt like it wasn't super interesting. It wasn't super interesting, and that's a trend that's sort of um, been gaining momentum in the past few years. Uh, it's hard to know why. I think maybe the, the, the broader innovations in gaming, you know, we've sort of established those uh, a few years back. So now what we're seeing are these sort of new augmentations to gaming, right? And VR was one of them that was really exciting for the past few years. Yeah. But this year, so much of the hardware development that made new experiences possible has plateaued. Mm. So then what we're getting are new experiences, but even those new experiences aren't really delivering something that's terribly exciting. So for me specifically, going to CES this year felt like a letdown. Yeah. Because nothing left me feeling like, wow, I can't wait to tell everybody about that. I would even the VR just, stuff? Even the VR stuff. Really? I was basically just doing my job. And I love VR. Mm. You know, and there are some experiences that, that really speak to me. There weren't I didn't the only one there that that really moved me in a way where it's like, man, this is special was something I did back in March. Really? So I can't attribute that to a success of CES. Which one was that? Um, so this is I forget the name of it, but it's essentially a HTC Vive demo where you have a palette with a bunch of different colors. You can choose from a bunch of different brushes and you can paint in 3D space and move around this box and and again, like paint in 3D space. There was a demo in uh, by one of the Disney artists who did uh, The Beast from Beauty and the Beast. Mm. And so imagine you just have a brush and you're just like drawing curves and you can like change your perspective on that curve and it just hangs in midair. <laughs> right. And you can add to it and you can add effects to it. That's cool. It's, it's the sort of thing you just lose yourself in because it feels like magic. Mm. It's not trying to take a first person shooter or anything we know about in relation to video games and put that into VR, it's something that is like, okay, VR is different. What would we like to do with this technology? Like forget everything we know, mm. Let's start from scratch. And yeah. this is a really good example of that. So let's, uh, I guess one of the cool things about this year's CES was that yourself and Justin got to experience Oculus and the HTC Vive like within minutes of each other. Yeah, at with, the same appointment, it was with cool. NVIDIA and it was literally leave from one, go right to the other. So I'm really interested because most of the time there's like months apart where yeah. that's the case. So I'm very interested to hear uh, what you think or like develop on what you said last week, which was the HTC, you're actually way more excited for that than the Oculus now? I'm more excited for it in terms of where I think it's going to take VR faster mm. um, because it is very much a premium product, right? It's going to be more expensive than the Oculus. I cannot imagine how, how expensive do you think it's going to be 750. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my guess because uh, just because of like all the extra stuff you need. Well, well you get all the accessories, right? I don't know if you get all the accessories. You don't with with the, the Rift from Oculus. You just get the headset, right? You don't get the, right. the hand so tracking right, stuff. So the, right. you get the Xbox one controller too. 
I mean, that's, not that that's a big deal. That's right. well, yeah. I mean, that's I, not a VR accessory, right? That's just like a yeah. That's yeah, just yeah, a regular yeah, sure. thing. Yeah. So, but for, for the, the the Vive, you have these two controllers that are kind of similar to Oculus's, but not mm. um, without getting into too much detail. And then you have these sensors that detect where you are in space. Um, but the one feature that the Vive has that you can't find on the Rift is this this magic eye sort of camera on the front. Right. And what that does is um, when you walk up to a wall or you're near an object. Uh, this can detect how far away you are and it sort of creates like a ghostly image within whatever experience you're right. doing. It doesn't like flip to the camera. It creates like a ghostly image of what's near you. So you know like, oh crap, I'm about to walk into a wall. Is it literally that wall, but just like, it's like transparent a, or it's something? Like, or? It's, it, it's like a transparent, like <laughs> misty blue that appears and you're right. like, uh, okay. Like if I get too close, it gets bigger. If so I back up, it fades away. It's like the virtual reality virgi- version of uh, the when you're reversing in a car and it's beeping. It's like that thing. Yeah. Or just, it's just like, a visual like letting you know yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're close to it. Um, and that does help. Why well, does it? It's, it's, it sounds like the type of thing that would be anti-immersive because it's pulling you back into the real world. But it, it, well, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, right? Like, if you know, we're going to be doing VR and moving in free space, mm. we have to be cognizant of the world around us. And if you were in a game and you constantly had a wall, like a virtual wall in front of mm. you, then you would really understand, like, yeah, I'm just limited to the seven by seven space or whatever. But with this. Maybe, you know, the game can limit your movement, but you can still see in the distance, mm. right? So this gives you the opportunity to be in a part of an environment that's larger than you can move in. And if you happen to wander too far, at least you kind of learn your limit. Right. And watching that video, which was interesting because, you know, it's kind of cool to see you guys being able to move like that. There was that guy kind of holding on to the cord to kind of yeah. make sure like, hey, okay, <laughs> like the, the cable wrangler, yeah, yeah. right? Like yeah. if you had it on a camera and whatnot. So how do you view people kind of dealing with that on their own like can they do that on their own um i mean there were some demos that i did uh i think different from the one you saw where i was just sort of moving around with the cable dangling behind me and it does kind of feel like it it can be a bit cumbersome Mm. Uh, i think there are mechanisms that could fix it say if you have uh you know sort of a, a bar with some tension coming off your waist like some light aluminum that just arcs it off so it like falls at an arc behind you and not right. right down your back on your leg to your feet. That could be one solution. Um, you know, latency is really important with VR and that's why they're not wireless yet because the technology just isn't there. Yeah. But uh, give it a few years. I'm sure companies will come up with great solutions. If not, local computing will become faster and then you can just have something on your back. Uh, I guess the final question I have for you on this as the person who I think yeah. understands the most about virtual reality in this office, at least like you've been following this for years before any of us ever really cared. Um, 2016, they say this is the year we, the rubber is going to hit the road. Like we're not talking about VR as like this concept anymore. You know, the Oculus has a price. Vive's going to have like pre-orders at the end of February. Like people are going to be able to buy this stuff. They're going to be able to have an Oculus in Q1. Do you think enough has happened for it to be a big success this year, not ne- not next year. Do you think there's enough happening this year or is 2016 going to be a transitional period where people like us in the press get to like play this stuff and are talking about it and are super excited, but like most folks at home are probably just going to be like, okay, I'm going to wait, like, you know, iPad, Apple Watch. I'll just wait a year or two and, and, and get it down the road. Yeah, I mean, VR has been sort of gestating now for a few years. And the way I look at it is 2016 will be the year that it sprouts. Mm. We begin to see signs of, you know, where it's going to go, both uh, commercially and, you know, as a medium that people create things for. Uh, I don't think it'll be a big success in 2016. That is something that will come probably five years down the road. Mm. I I imagine, you know, PlayStation VR will be niche. uh, HTC Vive will be niche. And some of these things will, you know, maybe catch more people's attention in special locations like amusement parks, things like that. You know, I mean they kind of have to start somewhere. Like we had arcades back in the day. Mm. We didn't have really powerful game machines that could handle that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Give it it five, eight years. You know, the Genesis could start to, you know, play some arcade ports. And, you know, it's it's sort of going to be that thing that that picks up steam. And before we know it, it will be that big success that is available to all of us. And a lot of the problems that you guys are asking me about won't really be problems at that Mm. point. So, um, again, I think it's going to be sprouting this year. And, you know, it will take probably four or five years before it's like, you know, we just, it's an afterthought that we just have it and we all love it. And we all have our own opinions about which is the best games and not whether or not it'll be here or not. Mm. Awesome. Thanks very much, Peter. Mm. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's Q1. It's the start of the year. 
that's the time when that many games come out traditionally false For, okay <laughs> well, that's true. Traditionally, yes. as, as somebody yeah. who <laughs> is uh, in charge of reviewing games here at games Pod, that's probably not the case but january for a while used to be pretty quiet it was yeah but a lot of stuff got pushed back to the q you know to q1 2016 that's true that's Fe- Fe- right <laughs> february this year is kind of crazy as well yeah, when i look no. at it uh, gone home console edition's coming out uh, so is that dragon cancer which you actually just played i just played this morning i finished right before i came into the studio <laughs> so <laughs> So you're super, super happy right now. <laughs> it's um, it's a it's a moving game, mm. um, and you know it deals with a a, a couple whose child is dying, mm. and they have other children, and they sort of have to navigate the waters of, you know, coping with the impending tragedy, coping with explaining this to their kids who can't actually understand what's happening, mm. struggling with faith. Uh, and faith is something that, you know, I was forced to go to church as a kid, but I never, it never really struck a chord with me. This game obviously didn't like change my mind about that, yeah. but it provided a very interesting look into you know, how faith can affect the way people deal with problems mm. and how they might deal with things when they lose faith and how that, that absence, uh, is in a way, both good and bad for coping right. and understanding, uh, that's interesting. I, I I felt I had like loads of weird Catholic, like growing up Catholic emotion. And very, I was very, very Catholic until I was in my teens and had quite a lot. I feel like I had a rough transition out of Catholicism. Mm. Uh, with Bioshock Infinite, that really tapped into some of that mm. stuff. But this game is actually, I don't want to spend too much time on any one of these, but uh, just because you've, you've literally, literally just played just this. Been, yeah. um, this is also developed by somebody who, this is like a real story. This is This actually happened to the developer. There are not many autobiographical games out there. This mm. one is like... You can't get more autobiographical than this. I yeah. mean, they're they're voicing it. They're dealing with their own experiences. They are creating these these abstract interpretations of their own emotions and thought processes. And uh, and yeah, and and like you really feel like you get to understand how they feel. I um the one thing I think is the game could have been a little bit longer mm. uh, because there are these moments where it's so heavy, and then it pulls back, and then before you know it they've sort of like gotten over a hurdle and you feel like, man, I just don't know if like I got the, the brunt of everything that they went through. That said it, uh, yeah, like this is a very personal story mm. and, uh, it, it's got, it doesn't play all that well, but play isn't important here. Yeah. That's, uh, that's not what it's about. Review on GameSpot soon. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, it's a special, special game. So we're giving the review special attention. Right. It's written right now. We're figuring out, um, how to put the finishing touches on it. Yeah. And you should see it either, uh, well, today or tomorrow. Cool. Tough game to review. Yes. Very and, tough uh, game to we review. had a freelancer do it. Tough game to even decide to review. Like it's kind of a... Yeah. That a, was a question. Yeah. Do we score this game? Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, But Justin Clark, our freelancer, wrote an amazing review. And um, yeah, mm. I can't wait for you guys to see it because this game needs to be talked about and people need to, I think, experience it. And it's one of the first games that I was terrified to play. Right. Not because it was scary, but because... I, like I didn't want to confront my own fears of death, yeah. my own fears of sorrow, and I know I'm not the only one. Mm. It'd be very hard for me to play. Yeah. I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. I lost two grandparents to cancer, so it's yeah. like a... Mm. It <laughs> yeah. is a tough game. Yeah. All right. Uh, let us know in the comments, actually, if you've uh, if you've uh, if this is a game you're not excited about, interested in playing, <laughs> or have played. Um, is it out now? It's out now. Okay, cool. So you can go play Steam? I'm assuming. Yeah, 15 yeah. Bones. It's PC only? Uh, Mac. PC, okay. yeah, for now. So, yeah. so today, uh, Gone Home is coming out on console. Uh, Dra- that Dragon Cancer is also out today. Review going on GameSpot real soon, right, Pete? Yep. Awesome. Um, January 15th, Oxen Free later this week. Uh, any of y'all interested in that? Uh, Mary's been playing it a bunch, and she seems super interested in it. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I don't know if I'm totally interested in it. Okay. I've, I've heard some like mixed things about it, mm. and time is so precious right now, but... Uh, that said, a lot of people who have played it are really enjoying it. Mm. So, I mean, maybe I'll give it a shot if I have more time. It's not even supposed to be that long, like five or six. Oh, hours. really? Yeah. Okay. Again, it's that the it, sort of thing you play over and over again. Right. Yeah. A game that you're probably only going to want to play once. January 26th, The Witness finally comes out. John Blow's follow up to 2007's Braid, I want to say. It's been a while. Yeah, 2007 or 8. Yes. A long, long time ago. That's going to be an interesting one. Mm. You interested in that at all? Mr. Uh, Tay? I, probably not so much. I mean, it looks really cool. Mm. Um, and, you know, hey, but- like, it's a lot of puzzles. There's like 650 or something. And like one of them's like, I think John Blow's like, oh yeah, I think 1% of you guys are going to get this puzzle. Really? Right. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, that same day, Lego Marvel's Avengers is coming out. So maybe you can play that instead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two days after that, January 28th, Rise of the Tomb Raider finally comes out on PC. I know people will be happy about that. Uh, February 5th then, XCOM 2. That's going to be exciting. I know Andy's excited about it. Uh, I've 
played a bunch. I think we can say now. Uh, Mike's played as well. Um, that game looks super cool. Um, I'm enjoying playing it a lot. Uh, you guys excited about that at all? XCOM 2? I didn't play the last XCOM, mm. so I still need to play that. But I'm looking forward to another strategy game coming out in February. What's that? Fire Emblem Fates. I thought you were going to say Firewatch, because that's coming out <laughs> February 9th. The same day. <laughs> when's when's Fire Emblem coming out? Uh, the nineteenth. Okay, I cool. Think. All right. Yeah. Uh, so February 9th, Firewatch is out. That'll be interesting. Uh, the Mighty Number no. Nine is apparently coming out. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. It still has a list of like seven or eight different consoles it's coming out on. Like uh, Vita is on there, and ooh. I think 360s <laughs> on there. I think we might be on there. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so we'll see. I guess. Yeah. Um. And then it's, this is a weird one. So the February 9th is also the day Unravel comes out. Yeah. But if you're on EA Access, you can play that on the fourth. Okay, that's so their the, typical thing, right? Yeah, five days. But this is like a game. So EA Access is a thing you can play for like 10 hours, right? Exactly, yeah. So you can complete Probably Unravel, basically. Unravel. <laughs> <laughs> 10 hours. So you can play it on the fourth if you want. Um, it's one of uh, three EA Access games, actually, to talk about here. Uh, one I know you're excited about, uh, February 16th, Street Fighter V is coming. Yeah, man, I can't wait. Um, graphically looks a lot better. Those, like, just the, the gameplay feel feels a lot better. And I think this time around, hopefully, crossing my fingers, I don't, I, same for Peter, maybe, um, that I, th I feel like that more people will be able to play this one. Mm. I, at least it seems that way. It feels a Wait, little bit more. Wait, hold on a second. Open. Are you saying hopefully for Peter because I'm a scrub? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just hope that's, that you, that's how I read it. No, no, no. I hope that you feel the same way that we have more people that want to play it. Oh, yeah. You know no, what I mean? That Versus, would be like, yeah. I mean, like, I love that we have people in the office that love playing the game, mm. and but like it would be nice to have more people. And I feel like that's what they're trying to push a little bit with this right. version because there's a little bit of a little bit more simplified mechanics, but also like there's high level play, which is like yeah. finding that nice balance of, you know, accessibility, but you know, high level. I'm looking forward to it. I tried to get into fighting games again on Street Fighter 4 and I'm gonna try again on Street Fighter 5. <laughs> right. um, we've also got a couple of days after that on February 23rd, Far Cry Primal is coming out. At least on consoles, the PC version is not coming out for a week Isn't after that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Isn't that, that is it's so just crazy. Just around the corner. Like, I kind of wouldn't be surprised if like in two days time we find out it's been pushed back a month or something. It better be in two days because I got to start printing discs. They got to <laughs> yeah, start doing all that stuff. I feel like it's going to come out though. Yeah. It just looks it's done. just so close. They, they wouldn't be this far along or they wouldn't have announced it so yeah. late that close to the release date if they weren't confident. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, also that same day, if you're not into Far Cry Primal, you can play Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2, uh, which is the second of the EA Access games, which is coming out uh, earlier. You can play it on February 18th. Um, nice. if you so wish. It's so weird. Because the thing about Unravel is you can literally play that game. And like, EA Access isn't like a, you can buy it day earlier. Like, right. you, you can just go play it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like I played enough Need for Speed on EA Access. I got 10 hours of that game. That was enough. I was like, great. Yep. Done. Yeah. Same with Battlefront. Yep. Done. I literally didn't buy Battlefront because of EA Access. Would you have, would you have purchased Need for Speed? Okay, no. Okay, I actually so, wouldn't yeah. have wouldn't have bought either of them. That you, yeah. Right, but they got your subscription box, right? So that's yeah. that's how it pays off for them, I guess. Like, it's a good way to sort of, like, sweep up the people that yeah. probably wouldn't have invested 60 bucks, but and 10 bucks. I definitely buy costs. Unravel, though. Yeah. yeah. No, thing. yeah, that, that looks really interesting. So that's a strength. It yeah. does. Uh, but yeah, if you want, you can get PVZ2 on February 18th on EA Access. Um, Rocket League's coming out on Xbox One sometime in February. They haven't seen it said when exactly, so that's TBA. Uh, but on the 1st of March, finally, we can play... David Cage's magnum opus, <laughs> Heavy Rain, on the PlayStation 4. It's coming to next-gen consoles, baby. <laughs> there you go. Sure. Uh, yep. <laughs> French sound and children <laughs> now on the PlayStation 4. All right, that's enough to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, March 8th, Tom Clancy's The Division is coming out. That's crazy. That's yeah. like less than two months away. I think Finally. A couple months ago, we were saying, where is The Division? Yeah. Now, it's knock, knock, knock. Yeah. <laughs> right, of course. We'll, see, we'll see about that. Uh, we can't really talk more about that at all at the moment, so hopefully we will be able to soon. Um, March 11th, Hitman's coming out. That was a game that was originally going to come out December with that first package. That really weird release plan yeah. where it's like, you're paying full price, but you're getting all the stuff, but just not yet. Yeah, you'll get it <laughs> later. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, I've yet to see that work anywhere. People were even frustrated with Mario Maker when it was giving you things yeah. slight, like hours later. Right. <laughs> so yeah. the idea of weeks later for content seems a bit crazy. Uh, yeah. At least for a full price game, you know. It's so. the it's the sort of thing that it, I mean, I actually am not a big Hitman fan anyway, or any kind of Hitman fan. That's the sort of thing that just makes me feel really comfortable not caring about that. Game. Oh, really? It's like on a your, personal level, not yeah. caring about it. Yeah. Um. Uh. The last game, I guess. Uh, well, actually, the last game is coming out that month. Is at the end. Is uh, UFC the new UFC is coming out? I got yeah. Conor, Conor McGregor shirt on. <laughs> 
the only champion on the box mm. that <laughs> Rousey lost hers. Let's hope there's no curse. Please, yeah, that's no true. EA curse. Please. Uh, so that's, a, that's the third of the EA Access ones. But more importantly, I think, for, for the wider gaming world, March 28th uh, is when Adrift Kronos Eve Valkyrie come out because it's the same day that the Oculus Rift comes out. Kronos is awesome. Yeah. I think once more people get a chance to play that, they'll realize how how cool it is. It's like the it's one of the few games that I think takes traditional game design mm. and ports it well to VR by tweaking a few things. It is sort of the atmosphere and puzzles of Zelda with the the tone is similar to atmosphere, but the tone and gameplay of Dark Souls. Mm. Wow. Uh, it's it's great. It's real fun. I really liked it. You got me to play it at Gamescom. Yeah. And I was really taken back by how much I enjoyed it, actually. That's good. Cool. Fun. Yeah. So I'm not alone. Oculus Rift as well. If you pre-ordered, you can get one. You'll be getting one on 28th, hopefully. I know they they, they yeah. push back the dates for some people. Um, and then the last thing, I gave this its own section because there's too many of them. I'm not sure if anyone gives a shit. So if you don't care about Assassin's Creed Chronicles, you can just stop watching this video right now. <laughs> but if you do care, um, the last two Assassin's Creed Chronicles games, I guess China came out last year. It feels like yeah. it came out a while ago. Like It feels like it came out maybe back in September or October. I, sh I probably should research that. It's been a while. Anyway, India. Assassin's Creed Chronicles India coming out January 12th. Then Assassin's Creed Chronicles Russia is coming out February 9th. And that's also the same day that the trilogy, which will have China, India, and Russia all together, uh, is coming out as well. So if you want to play some hot 2D Assassin's Creed video game, <laughs> they got your back. Ubisoft got three yeah. games uh, for you to play. Uh, okay, that's that's all the games coming out in Q1 2016. If you had to pick a favorite right out of all of those, what would it be? Tank first. Um, out of all that, probably Street Fighter Five, yeah. with some hope that the division is kind of fun because yeah, it means something Destiny like, but not Destiny right now. I'm feeling real weird on the division. I'm feeling I can't get into it, but I feel like it's either gonna be, it's either gonna be another Watch Dogs disappointment or it's gonna be something fucking cool, and I really can't tell right now. It's yeah. like I'm, I'm can't wait to. See see more about that uh i'm probably more excited about xcom 2 than everything else the witness as well i'm actually super excited about um and maybe far cry primal uh, what about yourself uh fire emblem fates cool and the dash street fighter 5 cool awesome yeah. uh, let us know what you are most excited about uh in the comment box below what are you looking forward to in q3 what do you think will slip and what do you think will suck let us know in the comments all right, folks, uh we've had a, a nice bit of chatter about video games but it's time to let the game creators talk for themselves. Uh, what? Folks, yeah, I know. <laughs> They've got a voice. Huh. They want to talk about the games they made. And right. sometimes they want to play <laughs> games that they actually didn't make at all. And that's what we have this week. So you guys asked for more developer stuff uh, on the lobby. Uh, last week, Steve Gaynor, the creator, uh, or one of the many creators at the Fulbright Company, uh, those who made Gone Home, was in town. Gone Home is coming out today on Xbox One and PlayStation 4. So we got him in to talk about Gone Home. And what better way to talk about Gone Home than playing the Gone Home map in Counter-Strike. So this is a video of me and Steve talking about games without guns that are in first person while playing Gone Home in Counter-Strike. Enjoy. Hello folks, and welcome to a very special episode of We Play <laughs> Developers <laughs> Games in Counter-Strike. Steve Gaynor, you hey. created a wonderful video game which not many people played, but it did go on to create the biggest Counter-Strike map in the history of CS. I, I, I like to think of it as our legacy. <laughs> you can obviously play this on uh, PC, but you can play it on console yeah. as of Tuesday. Yeah, Gone Home uh, is out this week on Xbox One and PlayStation 4. The thing is like that I really appreciate about this is I feel like just from playing it that it's a real kind of labor of love you yeah. know it's, it's like a, effort's been put in yeah it's an it's it feels like an homage or you know just like really trying to yeah like right here on my screen um you'll remember in gone home there's this light and there's this little crucifix next to it and he just used level geometry to put this little crucifix uh, oh yeah like look at that on uh that's awesome yeah so you know those those kind of things go a long way so check uh, so is this gonna be in here let's find out mm, that secret isn't in there but i can probably just rob this to do it let's see yeah there we go secret passage get down there get down there get down there, get down there. god i keep walking into this room with this wood <laughs> just full of fucking it's like this is the worst made cs map ever it's like dead ends everywhere it's almost like it's almost like 
It was never intended for anyone to play an FPS in this level. What is this? So if, have people stopped giving you shit about it being a walking simulator? No. No? It's, it's just more people are making walking simulators, so it's fine. <laughs> you trendsetter. Firewatch and The Witness, uh, yeah. you know, are coming out in the next couple months. We had, uh, um, like, maybe it's like Soma feels like yeah, probably I, in that well, like, Amnesia. I mean, Amnesia was uh, an influence on us. You know, it's a, it's right, a, yeah. it's a horror game, but it's a non-combat horror game. You're only... Abilities are, you know, walk around, hide, mm. find lamp oil, <laughs> you know, like, and, and that's and that's cool. Like, Amnesia was one of the games that showed us, like, oh, yeah, you know, they're doing something unique with a non-combat first-person experience. Um, Dear Esther did something unique with a right, non-combat yeah. first-person experience. 30 Flights of Loving. Um, there are all of these reference points, and I think... You know, those games and Stanley Parable mm. and, you know, uh, other stuff that, that has come out in the interim, I think, has kind of popularized the idea of there's a lot we can do here. You know, like we're, we're working on Tacoma for our next game. There's um, a drift that's coming out, which is like a, a floating simulator. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? But I, I think that um, walking, I think it's one of those terms where walking simulator kind of started as like a burn yes and then it's like well it's actually just i don't know it's what we got like that's the best name for it you walk around <laughs> and stuff happens it's cool i don't know and it's now an established genre but actually a bunch of quite good games in it yeah what's the fastest you've ever completed gone home with uh 49 seconds <laughs> die, 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 die. yes i gotta what? kill yeah so if that's if the through line is that there's no guns like especially as somebody who's worked on bioshock which are yeah. you know wonderful narrative games which some people, especially Infinite, have said that kind of were, maybe, are they hamstrung by the fact that they need to have shooting in them? Well, or, you know, people are at least like, oh, the best, you know, the best part of Infinite was when you like weren't shooting. The first yeah. hour or so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that kind of on the opposite side of it, you know, I, I was the lead and writer of Minerva's Den, which yeah. was the DLC for Bioshock 2. Fantastic DLC as well. I mean, we were, yeah, we were really proud of it, and... You in know, in a lot of ways. Um, oh my god! I just noticed. <laughs> yeah, sorry, in the top corner, there's the mini map, and, <laughs> and you made it the, <laughs> the map. map screen uh, from Gone Home. That's very good. good. I hadn't noticed that. You play through the whole game. You get through the all the way through the power curve of a Bioshock game. You beat the boss of Minerva's Den, and then the last you know 10, 15 minutes, 10 minutes of the game are you go down into Porter's office and you're your guns go down and it's just about you being in an environment yeah listening to an audio diary exploring this evidence of what was in this guy's personal space and what it meant to him and so you know we were kind of i think starting to explore the idea of what's bioshock without guns yeah as kind of the um dinamon of a bioshock experience <laughs> in that case um and you know in infinite it was like the introduction to a bioshock experience and mm. i think that that's something that um I really need to buy guns. I keep getting distracted. <laughs> I just keep I just keep coming out with my shitty Glock, and I'm like, why do I keep dying? Oh, right, because other guys have like assault rifles. Well, we're also uh, doing an interview, and we can't hear gameplay either. I think those are bad excuses for us being bad at games. Yeah, that'll be the headline. Gone Home Creator sucks at real games. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part of, of what we were going for was saying like, we want to see what it's like to to have you know a game where the the heart of the experience is the non combat story exploration mm. and that it is intentionally like a small focused single, you know, um, um, arc where it's like, okay, I, I played through this in a few hours and I could really delve into it. And now I feel like some closure, you know, like I actually, I, I, I started in this thing hmm. and I played it over the course of one, you know, long, you know, evening of gameplay or a couple of days. And I really felt like I got to like fully uh, uh, internalize all of that and, and feel like I had a complete experience. Yeah, does the limit from that come from the fact that it's it's difficult to hold people's attention if they're not engaging in that sort of combat? Or does the limit in that come from that's just the best type of narrative experience you can make is that it is dense and that it does sort of wrap up before it overstays I, I, its time? I think it's a few different things in our case. So, by the way, kitchen, good. Pizza <laughs> box in the place where there's a pizza box <laughs> in the game, good. Refrigerator. So I think for us it was both because we needed to build a small game because we were a small team of course. and we're doing it on our own um, resources which are you know limited. Um, but uh, you know I, th I think there is some real value to having uh, uh, the length of a story, especially like a you know small personal story, be. Um, <laughs> this is a grenade party happening here. Uh, be be like focused and not overstay as welcome. I think we don't know if we could make this be good for 
that long. 12 hours if we wanted to. So it's kind of good that we can't because you know, <laughs> like we're, we're just going to do the best we can with making it a few hours long and, and having the density of the, the experience so you feel like every room is really filled with a lot of stuff that's worth seeing. Yeah. You know, you don't feel like, well, here's just another empty room. Here's one thing with like one, you know, one note in it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what the witness ends up doing then because that might be a question that that answers. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, I feel like the witness is, you know, a lot of land mass, a lot of um, kind of ambient exploration. Mm. But I think that that's, you know, that's partly what the, the puzzle aspect is, is about, you know, um, I, it'll be really interesting to see, yeah, what what that really means. I think in practice. Oh fuck! No, I'm getting shot by enemy mans. <laughs> <No. laughs> Unlucky. So does this ever make you think? Oh, we should have made like a competitive gone home experience. Yes. Or like a co or like a co-op. Oh, I just shot my friend. That was me. No, no, I'm shooting all my friends. I hate my friends. Why? 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 <laughs> Why do I act like this? I'm gonna go. That could be your again. parents coming back. Oh no, that was. Oh, this was why <laughs> the house was empty because the teens <laughs> killed everyone. Before you got here. There's someone here. Oh fuck! I need to hide. Can we? Can we hide under the stairs? Fuck this guy! Fuck this guy! No! Did you get him? No, I didn't. <laughs> Mr. V. Oh, he's. I can tell you where he is because. We're... Oh, so yeah, we can, he's, you're he's saying come. we can cheat? Yeah, stay is there. Stay. I'll tell you when he's gonna come around the corner. Okay. We're cheating. Yeah, just stay there. We're cheating. He's, almost, he's like five feet out, okay? He's gonna be there in three, two... <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Oh, final round. Okay, it says final round. Oh, it okay. does? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, this is gonna it. be final round, so... Let's do it. We're 7v7. Oh shit, you're in the attic? Yeah. Oh, they stuck me downstairs. Oh no, there's a dead person there already. Fuck you, Mr. V. I'm gonna avenge you. Yes, I killed him. Oh, nice. Oh shit! Some garbage. He killed me. you. Some oh, garbage. Oh, fuck. Oh, oh. Don't, don't kill Steve. Steve made the game this is based on. Be nice <laughs> to him. Him is me. Steve is GS Here we go. man. No, go. No, no, oh. no, 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 no. No, right. Spray and pray. I got, I got seasoned greeting <laughs> instead. <laughs> no, it sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, what's what is gonna happen? This is tight. This is like, this is close. Yeah. 7v7, god. Oh, there's two of there's two there's, yeah. there's two of them and one of us up in the attic. How fitting that the game ending. Yeah. In the attic. <laughs> of, of, uh, an epic showdown in the attic. Take Oh, oh. Congratulations, Counter Terrorist. Congratulations, oh, Mr. V, No Ray, Frank Bullet67. Congratulations, Gone Home Counter Strike Community. Yeah. Congratulations, mm -hmm. another CS, great Gone day. Home. Yeah. In, in this incredibly popular competitive map. <laughs> GameSpot's Game of the Year 2015 was The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. That's kind of all y'all got to hear, was that that was the Game of the Year. What you didn't get to hear was all of the screaming and conversations and... Throwing of feces. All of that stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry so that. <laughs> we're going to get into a little bit of that, uh, sort of how we got uh, got into that or how we got around to The Witcher 3 and this. But also, this is kind of more importantly what I want to do is like... This is a, Andy had this idea. We're going to round up everyone else's Game of the Year awards. So we're going to basically cast shade on all the other games' <laughs> websites and say, that's bullshit, that's bullshit, or what we agree with. Um, uh, let's get into our conversation, I guess, via some of the other winners. So Games Radar picked Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, as Game of the Year. It was that Rocket League and The Witcher was kind of this like three-way conversation that we had forever. Uh, Peter, that was your favorite Game of the Year. It was. Uh, you gave it 10 out of 10 um, on GameSpot. Uh, this year was fantastic for, for games. We had a couple of 10 out of 10s. That was one of them. Um, yeah, what did you what did you think about the conversation we had about like you agree with Games Radar that it, it was Game of the Year? What do you think about the conversations that we had about The Witcher and Rocket League and all that stuff? I haven't read Games Radar's justification. Mm. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal game, and uh, you know one of the things whenever I talk about before I start talking about why I love it, I always have to preface like cut cut people off by saying I know there's problems. Like right. I know there are times when quiet is just unnecessary mm. like her appearance i know the second half of the game had some pacing issues right and the story maybe felt truncated at parts um but for me you know the first thing was the gameplay mm. was just impeccable like there's so many things happening at once and once you really get in tune with the controls it, it all happens so seamlessly and you almost forget how intricate it was to begin with mm. but then when you look back or you start to play other games you're like why aren't i transitioning from one position to another as smoothly like how come I can't just quickly whip something out or react <laughs> yeah, to a, yeah. a scenario? Um, so the game, the the controls were one aspect. 
the visual presentation both within cinematics and within the game was astounding mm. and, and that made it really easy for me to just sort of find myself you know in awe of what was happening around me um and and quiet you know again for as many problems as she has uh I don't want to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't played it, unless yeah. you guys agree. Don't, no, no, don't, don't, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. But get to like, yeah, I know uh, you're. Yeah, she, she, you're allowed to take companions with you into the field, mm. and uh, I used her quite a bit because I liked her abilities. I thought they gave me a good tactical advantage. Uh, right, uh, 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 <laughs> and uh, because you know, she can't speak for one reason or another, and yeah. uh, but one thing she can do is hum, and so you know you don't ever always see her when she's with you versus like. D dog who's next to you, right? Right. She could be off somewhere, but you have radio communications. And when she's trying to tell you that she's ready to do something, mm. she starts to hum this little tune in her ear. And I never f like. It's easy to feel alone in Metal Gear, even right. if you've got, you know, your dog with you, because it's, it's an animal that's really not that smart. Yeah. Like you can kind of tell what to do, and it's cute, but it's really you can only rely on yourself and big boss is basically a one-man army yeah like but not with quiet with quiet you're a two-man army and you know i i i i felt really attached to her and the mm. way that the game sort of manipulated that feeling of attachment right it it i I've, can't remember a game that i've ever played that made me wrestle with so many feelings you know for for one character like that um and that like but it wasn't even like a scripted part of the story i mean it right is scripted but optional mm. the sort of things that happen and it all has to do with how attached to her you are <laughs> yes how much yeah you're uh, it, we, yeah. let's not get into no, the, know, any more yeah. of it but that that was kind of what like the crux of the last the, the the biggest the most frustrating part of the game of your conversation was between these kind of three games and where they sat and how it worked because like that experience that you had i didn't have because not alone did i not use her very often right. i also only completed the first half of that game which was like 70 hours or whatever but like i didn't so i didn't even get to past that point you hadn't completed the witcher 3 right so all the things we were talking about was and like these were both games that were like 120 hours long yeah. we had played all these other games and then like rocket league is this like trying to compare rocket league with metal gear solid or the witcher is a fucking nightmare because it's like it's a five minute game and it repeats it just yeah. for some people it really works it worked for rock paper shotgun they they gave it there they did loads of weird game of the year kind of bits and bobs all over the place they said it was the, the, their favorite overall game of the year um yeah, you you cited on that one, right? You still you still think it was the best game that came out last year? Yeah, and I fucking love Metal Gear Solid. Like, I played a lot of it mm. on PC, and, and you like, love The Witcher. Oh, I love love The Witcher. If I'm, we're gonna give like love love love, and I love 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 <laughs> Rocket League. It's our new rating system yeah, here yeah. on GameSpot. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so like Metal Gear was awesome, and there's so many systems at play, and everybody just goes on and on about that, and it's true. Did like, you finish it? I did not finish it. Damn it! But like, there's I got so many far, things dude. that they, there's so. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but like more than even what I was talking about earlier. Anyway, and we had the like, same problem in the Witcher I love Three. The setting in Metal Gear, yeah, especially yeah. like that kind of eighties, but tech like higher tech yeah. than we have now. But like Cold War and Soviet. Man, play, play that game man, in the post Bowie world. Oh yeah, as well. like, all that stuff. Diamond Dogs plays and together fucking, so well. Like, yeah, yeah, and like it's so strong the the movement and the stealth and then all the abilities. Like you're saying, don't get me wrong. Like that was a phenomenal achievement. And then you go to like Witcher, right? And I'm such a huge Witcher fan, mm. fanboy, and like that game delivered on every little thing you would ever want out of an open world Witcher game. It's, but it's, and all, so, more. it's all so subjective, though, isn't it? Because is. like it's, it's so all anticipation subjective. and what you yeah. want. And, and then Ro Rocket League is like a game you don't even know anything exactly. about. Exactly. And but like the, the characters and everything in The Witcher, like that's basically all The Witcher can stand on, right. I think, because like the gameplay is all right. Mm. right, and the systems are kind of jank, and the inventory is jank, and the crafting, whatever, it's mm. it's deep, but like. Do you really want to? Like, it, it you definitely can't, like, hang your hat on it. Yeah, it has more wrinkles than Metal Gear. It, for oh sure. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but like, it's so strong. <laughs> like as a <laughs> narrative experience, and like as a game fan, and as like uh, artist, <laughs> you know, whatever. Like we love. Like I love that shit. Like, yeah. That's when I think about game of the year. It's like aspiring to greatness. Yeah. Right. What game got there the best? That's kind of the way. So what is and it? About Rocket League. So so this transitions <laughs> into that, right? So it's like. I think Metal Gear was like systems, the best game. Uh, Witcher was like art, yeah, the best game. But then it's like okay, and then out of nowhere, Rocket League consumed my fucking life. It's like a fun, it's it became a sport. It's mm. intoxicating. Yeah, and yeah, and I think the reason that I have to say it's my personal game of the year, why I think we should have pushed it for game of the year, was 
it's going to stand longer in my life than a- either of those games. Right. Uh, not just like playtime wise. But just length of time wise, like and when you think back of like the games you loved yeah. in like ten years from now, you'll pick that one out. Yeah, like so th- when when I have to rank my personal games of all time, yeah. Rocket League's on that list. Whereas like Metal Gear kind of falls down, <laughs> and so does Witcher because like I because it's like irra- it's irrational love of games. Like yeah. it's Skyrim, Max Payne. But to, but to, to, to the funny Rocket thing League about that is right? that like what we're, that's the problem we have is because by the time we got to those last three, it's so personal. It's so personal. It's yeah. like and like and how do you say? My personal feeling yeah. of this game is more than you because I guess the problem we had was that you definitely loved Metal Gear Solid perhaps more than the median level, but there was this force for Rocket League because there were so many people. Right. But so you, we just uh, had to like we had to talk between it, like the conversations were long because it was like how went the, does you know popular vote matter against consensus vote? Right. And so, well, so that was the thing though is that we ran like a staff wide popular vote and the numbers were very different for the top three Mm. like metal gear had way more support and until we started to to whittle things down and and and, you know have these open discussions and an impassioned speech can change people change people's minds yeah and passion one way or another (laughs) can really (laughs) alter people's opinions yeah I, i think it's easy to argue logically for rocket league as well like as That's a, a, like all the games you can argue logically, but yeah. like as a video game, like it's it is a fucking video game. Like mm. you're playing it, you're interacting, you're getting better, you're you're playing with your team. It's like it's the culmination of all this modern stuff. Like good matchmaking, like it was free, so everybody there's a huge pool of players. Mm. Like you get better and good you, online communication, good online communication, like good easy control, communication, like yeah. journey style, right? No good, problem, yeah. no, like, problem, no, no problem, problem. Take the shot, <laughs> defend it. Like it's you know you, know, you just. Yeah, it just becomes and <laughs> this stupid thing I wrote that I I'm gonna share and it's so far up my own butt, but who cares? <laughs> it was like so Witcher. It's a dark place. So this is just comparing Witcher and Arkham. Witcher, yeah. the the art is, the writing, the characterization, mm. the acting, the storytelling, uh, the pacing, everything that goes into that, but like. The, the poetry in Rocket League is actually you doing it on the field. Like right. You leave your mark on the field. Jaco Benito, baby. You're, goal. you're talking about game. the beautiful game. And to me, that's more powerful <laughs> in, a, in a way, right? Yeah. Like, but, and, okay, but so why, yeah. is that, why is that different from something like FIFA? And I'm not saying that oh, okay. I think yeah. it, it isn't. Good question. But, I, just, but that, I think people would probably benefit from I think hearing why. Danny so actually it, like, broke that down really well. Or it's like in FIFA you're playing it yeah. as a team. The, 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 the quick elevator pitch of that is like in FIFA you're playing as a team and in Rocket League you're playing as a foot. You're like your, your direction over the ball is, is it's like it's about where you hit that ball and where it mm-hmm. goes, not the plays you're making. So it's kind of like it's like a macro micro kind of thing and for me like rocket league uh i've said it a bunch of times last year was like it was, it was the best soccer game best football game i've ever played because it felt more like when i was i like i played football my whole life and yeah. it felt more like on and even like the weirdest thing is like because i played on goal like from my whole life like at various like levels like i've, I've played for like t- 20 years i guess and i have had times where i have like run, as a goalkeeper predominantly so I, i've had times where i've run across the goal and like fingertip like anticipated this ball i think it's going to go there they hit it and then i barely saved it and i still remember those moments and like i have done that in rocket league and it's felt the same sure and so and that's like really strange so powerful but anyway so that's anyway. Got that kind of stuff that we got into yeah. so it's interesting to look at some of the other winners on different websites the guardian gave for instance bloodborne was one that bloodborne fans like the people Blood, who bloodborne. want bloodborne to be game of the year are so sure that it's game of the year. And we had a lot of people saying like, it's fine you think that, but Bloodborne's the best game that came out this year. Uh, RPS, uh, or sorry, um, The Guardian thought that as well. What do you think about that, Peter? It's a tight game. Yeah, no, it's a it's one of those games that I wish I was better at because I didn't mm. get, I wasn't able to finish it. Um, and partially that was due to time because I wasn't able to get better. But that game has amazing atmosphere and it has really, really good mechanics that are difficult but fair. Mm. Um, I think it has a lot of go- things going for it. What I think was missing from me when when listening to other people talk about it is that it was solid but not special. Right. And uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe that's because we have Dark Souls and that was sort of a semi blueprint for uh, for Bloodborne. Um, but at the same time, like I, I'm not going to sit here and say it's not an amazing game that doesn't deserve recognition. Mm. And if they had the best experience with it, then kudos to them. Yeah. Like, that's that's what they believe it is. A little bit of an outlier in terms of the median. That should yeah. not be. Uh, denied that's not like this is the interesting thing about game of the years is that like nobody's wrong Uh, yeah which is uh, IGN for instance the Imagine Games Network they picked the same game we did which were three wild hunt Um, 
I guess the one the, the, this is the one we're leading up to because it's it's the one in which people are saying like no that's wrong and I think there's a lot of interesting discussion to have about this which is that <clears throat> although uh, Polygon gave Witcher the best open world game yeah. their game of the year eventually went to Her Story which is a game I think we had on I think it was like 18th or so on ours so we did recognize it as a as a great game it won a bunch of awards at the Game Awards uh, it's kind of in a lot of people's top tens around there um, but it is kind of interesting to think that either the consensus vote or the popular vote put a game that was so far down the list of so many people's uh, game of the year uh, right at the top. Uh, Peter, what do you think about that? The, the, it kind of does speak to the people who work at Polygon, right? It does, like, it makes sense. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, of course, that's the game the Polygon would probably go for, right? Um, yeah, but I don't know that I want to, like, whittle it down to just the identity of Polygon uh, or just sort of, like, well, we know who works there and what they like. Right. But, you know, like, people we're so concentrated in our discussions because we work in an office together. Like the games that we play like rocket league that we fall in love with, mm. you know, that sort of, it, it starts to fold in on itself and become, you know, this deeper thing. Uh, and so who knows, maybe the right mix of people played it there and, and got enough people's ears and then they played it and their discussions around it were more impassioned because in the office here, you know, when we started playing that game, it was like, oh, her story is actually pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, like, and then we we kind of like dabbled in talking about certain things, but I also don't think enough people played it. And I don't think we had long enough discussions mm. about what happened in that game uh, and why it worked. And I think maybe if we did, and this probably applies to other games as well, it may have been higher on our list. Mm. Probably wouldn't have been top 10 though, right? Uh, or at least number number one. No, I, I don't think I don't think so. Not based on the personalities we have here. Mm. And again, I hate to sort of just like put people into a corner at Polygon or any website and say, well, of course they chose that. But um, but you know, I mean, th there is this perception that they are very socially focused mm. and uh, they're into experimental stuff and you know, whatever. That's that's kind of an interesting thing actually that we kind of touched on um, a lot of the times in our conversations here is that like games press loves something new. Like we probably appreciate the new more than most uh like the median gamer because right. we're interacting with so many games all the time so when there's something new it kind of like sparks a, a, a joy in us because we're used to playing so many so many things yeah. so i wonder if there's something because the, the the public reaction to something like this is either people saying like oh okay that's great you're championing a new type a different type of game then the other people would say like oh it's an fmv game and you're just being contrarian for the sake of it because like you want to look different and no one's going to pick her story this year uh so if what we're talking about is actually that this is just something that they really liked, uh, is it to be criticized or could, like, how do you feel about the idea that the games press should represent gamers and not tell it, it should, or like, how, where does it represent gamers and where does it represent people writing? You know what I mean? I mean, cause, I, cause that's, I feel like that's how people look at our game of the year as well. They go like, pick the right one. Because you're speaking for us, you know what I mean? Okay, anyone at home who thinks that that should be the case, yeah. next time you're talking to your friends about games, talk about the games that you think your sister would like. I mean, right. I, that's yeah, a ridiculous yeah. notion. Like, why should, I, why should I have to change who I am? Like, if I'm in this position, and my position is to talk about the games that I care about the way I want to know, or the way that I want to talk about them, that's my prerogative. That's all I care about. Games are very personal. They're not this thing that is to be sort of like mixed together and then like slopped on a plate and say, here you go. That, this is game for everybody. Please, Peter, can I have some more? <laughs> no, yeah, it's, uh, dude, I, I mean, this is, the, this is the problem we face in comment sections, right? Where people, right. people yeah. get very personal, but they don't realize because they think we're doing a disservice because they think that's what the average person wants. Mm. And the, uh, there is no average person unless, no. unless you're trying to go for like which game sells the most, but that comes down to so many hey, different Hey, guess things. what? How many people had Call of Duty on... Like if you like the next layer, of, exactly. The, the, the next layer of that is go. like, cause we can't say, oh, like then if, if you know, Polygon are like, let's just say they're being on like the, you know, they're representing 1% of people and like we're representing more people because we picked the, like fucking man, like destiny, right? <laughs> like the Taken King didn't qualify, but that, yeah. that that's what people were playing. People were playing Dota yeah. and League of Legends, yeah, Call so of Duty. That's a good question that I want to like pause it, right? Yeah, go for it. What if, cause we do the game of the year and because because it's fun i guess and gets traffic and whatever. yeah but like i what really if, enjoy the process i yeah. think it's like super fun it's a good way to like actually talk about games yeah. i kind of wish it didn't have as much import attached to it that's the only thing i don't like but like what if we had a every year there was an adjustment to like the best game ever <laughs> right <laughs> oh so it's like it's like a top 100 list that yeah. we just change 
100 seems like a So crazy. Half-Life 2 still at the top. So yeah, it's like five. <laughs> like what are the five best games ever? And it's yeah. like every year you like reevaluate <laughs> it. Like, and it's like Counter-Strike is still number one. Yeah, like Half-Life. And it's like, so how do you be better than that? Like Dota's up there, right? Like, and then what else? I don't Peter's know. like shaking his head like that. Yeah, that's just, that doesn't, that's, that's like, that's this year's problem yeah. multiplied by 100. Exactly. <laughs> if but I had if, my way, we would all write reviews without scores and just leave it at that. Right. We yeah, wouldn't yeah. do these top 10 lists. We wouldn't do. Oh, yeah. It, you know, I think it, I think it can devalue like the, t- the conversations around games really easily. Mm. And ranking games, it just becomes like a crap, not a crapshoot, but it becomes a, a very difficult process to actually be sound and reasonable. Right. And be able to easily quantify this is better than that. Yeah. yeah. At a certain stage, you just stand so, to. Because. We are like hypocritical by nature. So it's like, we're going to change our minds and contradict. And it's like so subjective and it's so fucking out there. People are playing loads of Counter-Strike right now. They weren't maybe 10 years ago. I mean, that Gone Home map is just blowing up. Yeah. (laughs) And so it's like, what what made that happen? Like League of Legends is super popular, but like I can't play it. You know what I mean? It's crazy. It seems like last year felt like a year where it was so difficult. Like any one of these games, you could say, is like easily like somebody's, and not even just somebody's, like yeah. one person's, but lots of people's yeah. favorite game, game of the year would be Bloodborne, Witcher, Her Story, Rocket League, Metal Gear Solid. Like uh, it's not hard for me to say, oh, this is my number one. But anything beneath yeah. that, it's like, ah, oh, shit. I don't, <laughs> but between five and six, like yeah. I, if I move them, does that look right? It's like, what did I, I like City I Skylines know. more than Mario Maker? <laughs> <laughs> like, do you it's wish there one. was like an academy? Do you or wish you had more time no. into your life so that you didn't have? Yeah, well, <laughs> well that's the, the problem because yeah, that too. Okay, yeah. So final point on this, I guess, is like okay, the end game of this is that we end up having something like the Oscars, right? right. Yeah. It's like we don't look at the Game Awards as like that's the be all and end all. Uh, and different various people look towards different people. Like some people look towards like, okay, I want to know what like Total Biscuits' favorite game of the year is, or I want to know what GameSpot is, or I want to know what like my favorite Twitch streamer is. But like di- different people so have many. different layers of import. Yeah. I don't think we want. Some like one, one big like one, one bastion of that because the, the Oscars feel like they get it wrong every year, or like right. or well, or they try and go for that popular vote, yeah, yeah. or somewhere between the popular vote and the artic, artistic vote, and they kind of like Birdman is the her story of like, films, ex- right? It, well, yeah, Birdman is like a Birdman is a game made for film critics, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you could say her story is a game that probably appeals to game critics more than it does to you know Joe Call of Duty if that's the median gamer. So, like, I don't know, I just want to recognize things for the special achievements. Like, right. Yeah. I, I, I pro- fire me GameSpot. <laughs> but, you know, but like, I just, I just think it's, it's what we're doing. You know, it doesn't really serve a, a really strong discussion about games. It just distracts and, and makes us argue again. When yeah. We try to say yeah. this is the best or the worst or whatever. We should just have like Peter Brown Game of the Year, and that's it. We don't say anybody else. Like, <laughs> we choose one person every year, and that's their year. Like fucking Hunger Games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have like a that's we have like a fucking yeah. gauntlet. You have to go. Oh through. no 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 no. Yeah yeah. We we volunteer Peter as tribute, yeah, and yeah. then we get all the other. I mean, we games basically press. do this as a pack. So yeah, yeah yeah. We get all the other games press to pick. And then who wins that gets game. We figured it out. We figured it out. We cracked this nut, (laughs) baby. Andy, Peter, thanks so much for coming on here and uh, figuring out Game of the Year 2016. (laughs) You bet. With me. Uh, Appreciate it. Uh, Let us know what you think was Game of the Year 2015, uh, which publication you sided with. Also, let us know, like, what do you think of the idea that anyone can pick any game for Game of the Year? Do you think there's importance assigned to Game of the Year? Do you have an appreciation for the fact that this stuff is so subjective and, you know, ultimately you shouldn't really push your opinion against someone else's opinion or is that something you enjoy let us know in the comments below all right we're done for a show this week thanks so much peter brown for coming in yeah always. you're a busy boy especially with cs so i really appreciate you coming in love being here uh, this week andy bauman pleasure as ever eric tay who's currently behind the camera <laughs> uh really appreciate it uh we're all building the new show at the moment um Josh Shaw isn't here at the moment because he uh, we're not using the TriCaster. Fingers crossed next week we'll be doing this live and maybe we'll have some of that. We'll see. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. But we're also going to do On the Way Out of Here. We didn't want to talk about it too, too much because it's it feels a little bit strange. Uh, David Boy passed two days ago. Obviously, he had a big influence on a lot of media. He had a big influence on games as well. You look at like look at the culture of, of games in 2015, even with like Metal Gear Solid having so many references to Bowie's work throughout it. Um, Omicron on the Nomad Soul, of course, Quantic Dreams first game back in 1999. He was involved in that. He mo capped and he also did some design elements of it. Uh, so we want to do a little bit of a shout out to David Bowie and also uh, Josh's snake, the Cuddy Sark, not the Cuddy Sark, Cuddy Sark also died that same day. So we're going to do an ode to both Bowie and that beautiful snake. Rest in peace, David Bowie. Rest in peace, Cuddy Sark. See you next week.